Hi, I'm Craig Frazier, and I'm here at the beautiful studios of Craytex Colors in Connecticut. And we're going to shoot a couple more videos for you. And this is going to be a new series we're going to introduce with this video. And the series is going to be uh, called the Cheap Tricks of Special Effects series, kind of as a little homage to my books in the past. Because we're going to show you a bunch of new techniques, some old techniques, and some different tricks that are used in airbrushing. And that can be anything from drop shadows to stencil effects to splattering to marbleizing, you name it. Anything that's an effect that can be used in airbrushing, whether it's on a canvas, a wall mural, a guitar, or a car, is in the category, cheap trick special effects. So today we're going to do drop shadows. Now, drop shadows are kind of cool because they give depth. Matter of fact, one of my first things I did with Cal Concepts Air Syndicate when I started working with Dion over there was I wanted to establish that all of our graphics should have drop shadows because it creates depth and it also creates cool separation, gives it a floating effect, it just adds so much more to the design and it's such a small amount of work by comparison to time to everything else in there. Uh, it also was job security on me. As long as there was drop shadows in the paint job, I got paid, so that always worked really well. Uh, but drop shadows can also be your nemesis. They may not take as much time as everything else, but if they're done cor incorrectly, they can have the opposite effect. Now, so I'm going to show you a couple of different ways of doing drop shadows, right and wrong, and also the techniques that, if you remember some of my old articles back in the day on how I would mix up the, the colors for drop shadows and my whole theory on drop shadows, we're going to kind of show that uh, here today on a couple of different examples. So first, I'm going to start off with the OG original paint I used to use for drop shadows, which was just black. Back in the day it was PPG and then later it was House of Color and then currently I'm using a lot of Createx. So we're going to use what was popular and still is popular amongst many people and it can be good and bad but we're going to use a solid opaque black as our first example of doing a drop shadow. So I'm going to mix them up right now and then we're going to get to painting. Okay, I mix this up off camera because I think we've done enough paint mixing on camera. Uh, but just to let you refresh you on the ratios here, I went with a three to one mix of uh, three parts of the, of the wicked opaque black I have right here and one part of the 4050 gloss. Now you may be wondering why I'm using the gloss and not the 4051 or 52. The gloss we discovered has a better adhesion property. Once it's mixed with paint, like especially in a low ratio of like 30% or you know three to one, it it basically loses most of its gloss. Let's say a little, they'll have a little satiny look to it, but it's not the issue of the gloss I'm concerned about. It's going to be clear coated later anyway. It is the adhesion I like. So 4050 is not just my go-to. Uh, it's it's a great gloss top coat for many things, but it is my go-to binder, but I also use it as an adhesion promoter ahead of time. I may hit something, I uh, did a, a project with a bunch of sculptures recently, and we had to come on top with a lot of different paints, and so I hit the entire sculpture because it had a, a sealer on it that wasn't one of ours, and I wasn't sure what the sealer was originally. I hit it with the 4050 just to give me that extra adhesion. So 4050, great adhesion promoter, binder, and top coat clear. Uh, I'll even use it, uh, if I'm going to satin clear something later on, or matte clear it, I'll still use a 4050 as the binder. So I, I go through a heck of a lot of that stuff. And then the reducer, 4011, that's my go-to reducer. It's literally the only reducer I use in my shop. And uh, anywhere from 2.5% all the way up to like 10%. But you can also hyper-reduce if you really, really need to, like you're pumping something through a micron. Uh, just be really careful. Uh, do not hyper-reduce any of the paints unless you have the 4050, or at least if you're doing a canvas work like I use for canvas, I use 4030. Um, I'll add 4030 to all my paints, and if I'm going to really, really get them super thin for s subtle details, make sure this is in there, because otherwise uh, you hyper-reduce some of these paints and it, it gets binder pore. So you, you add a little bit of binder to it, everything works great. Uh, Stir it all up in here, let it sit 15 minutes. I know it sucks. You don't want to let things sit 15 minutes. You got to. It makes a difference. Trust me. With a spray gun, it is a necessity. It is a different animal and you will have failures if you don't let that quart of paint sit there or pour it in your gun, let the gun sit there. Trust me, there's stuff you're doing that you can take 15 minutes for. For an airbrush, when it comes to details, even though you can spray it right away, trust me, detail-wise and gradated fading and shading and you name it, there's, it just let it sit. You know. But don't pre-reduce and let sit for five days like that. It's like the other end of the cord. People say, oh, I'll mix it all up now and I'll use it in a month. That's even worse. So, you know, 15 minutes, please. Okay, that, that, that plug is done. Uh, I've got my airbrush loaded up right now and I'm gonna show you uh, the wrong way to do a drop shadow. How's that sound? So anyone that actually is watching this and this is your drop shadow, this is your jam, I'm sorry, I'm not making fun of you. You suck, um, but trust me, it can, you can get better. Now, the concept of a drop shadow is you need a light source. 
let's say this is the front of a vehicle because if that was the front of a vehicle and I did a flame like that, someone should beat me because that's wrong. This is, the, this is the back of the flame. This is the front of a flame. So if the light source is here, the drop shadow would necessarily be, imagine the light's at an angle, it would cast a shadow. And what a shadow is, it's the exact same image, just canted down a little bit, you know, uh, to the point where a lot of people come in and do a drop shadow just like this. They'll come in and they'll do it from here and they'll go super dark with the drop shadow and go here super dark with the drop shadow. And they'll keep going back and, and they're, they're, they're just making sure it's solid. Now, that's not horribly hideous, but it's, it's really dark. It's really, really black. And you don't want your drop shadow to actually dominate your flame or your graphic at all. You want it to be a subtle thing. It's got to be something where people aren't saying, hey, look at the drop shadows from 10 miles away. You want to see it because it's showing depth. Drop shadows are just the absence of light. It's not, they're not black. It's not like a magical black thing that happens. It's just an absence of light. So to allow the color, let's say whatever color this is, this happens to be white, whatever color it is, you want it to be uh, just darkened. So if it was red, it used to be darker red. The way you can do that is by using a little bit more of a transparent paint. So that was my first discovery back in the day, year, many moons ago, that opaque black, I had to really, really thin it down. But when I thin, thin down the opaque black, Sometimes it's kind of spitty. It really wasn't that great. So I had to find a good thin black, a, a black had a fine uh, pigment to it. Now, this isn't the worst way you can do a drop shadow. Trust me. I've seen, you always keep track. What side, now I do it, now, I've done it so long, you kind of like, you get sick of nature to it. I know that this is a shadow and this is a shadow from the light casting down. But a lot of times they'll forget and they'll go and they'll do one on the top too. So this right here is officially the worst drop shadow known to mankind. Because that's not a drop shadow, that's just a, I call that a halo effect. Now I've done flames that I create a color halo all the way around for just a different effect, but officially world's worst drop shadow. We'll, we'll set it there. If this is your jam, I'm sorry. Now, the, you notice the way when I did this drop shadow, I came along and just followed it all the way to the end. And I started right at the tip and I ended it a little bit further. I probably should have ended it right at the tip because that's wrong too. If you go further, that's the way it should be. This drop shadow should theoretically start from here. And I'm spraying it a little bit lighter because I don't want it to be too dark. So even with, even with but you see it's a little, it can be a little spitty. And then I'll come here and I come along. But when I get to the end, I'm going to actually flare it out like this. Reason being is that shows like the flame is lifting off the page a little bit or lifting off the surface. It gives it more depth. Now I am going further than I did here. I went in, but I could have gone, I'm going way further out here. The pinstripe is going to come out there. It's going to, going to help me out on that. So sometimes I'll go way far on the shadow because I know the stripe is going to come out even further. See how doing that makes those tips pop out a little bit more. So you don't want to follow them all the way to the end. Just imagine it's the same thing down. Now, what's the even worse way you could do that? If you actually, I should have shown on this. I probably could. I can wipe it. So, and I'll show you why I can wipe it and get away with it in a second. Because I kind of cheated here and I'll show you what I meant. Just wipe this off. And I'll show you a third way you can... This was actually a correct drop shadow. It still was kind of spitty because I'm using opaque black. So that wasn't a bad way of doing a drop shadow. But, dry that off a little bit. And that, by the way, I was using was 4020. I don't spray with 4020. If I'm in really, 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 really cold weather, I might spike my 4011 with a little bit of 4020 just to, to help it dry a little bit faster. But I, I usually just use 4020 for cleaning because it's got acetone in it. Now, this is another way you can do a drop shadow incorrectly, where people see me do, remember the, the, the way I kept the tip away from the end? They'll actually see me do that, so they'll do the drop shadow like this. And, and I say, that's the wrong way to do it, and they're like, oh, but I stayed away from the tip. It's like, yeah, but you stay away from here. The flame, that's not the flame, that's a little stick. The flame, the drop shadow is just as thick here, it's shifted down. You don't see the back of it. You could actually fix, see, these are actually fixable. You can come in and fill that sucker in right there. See? And then it's better. You see, those are two ways you can very easily screw up a drop shadow. Too much, 
or like there's too little and too weird. Now the reason I wasn't really that worried about doing those is because I, I cheated. I just, I put a frisket over this whole, whoops, pull this off here. Damn, we got some good frisket here. Actually, it's actually a transfer tape. There we go. See, all better. So we're gonna pull all this off and then we're gonna start on the next flame. Okay, I got my, my, my cheater uh, plastic sheets off of there so we can start fresh. Now I'm gonna go ahead and do one flame up here with the opaque black. One flame I'm gonna do with the candy black, which is pretty much the way I do things nowadays. And then one with a tinted candy black. And this would be done for something that I really wanna emphasize a candy underneath, or it's such a subtle drop shadow over a certain color, we'll assume this color is red, I don't want even the candy black to damage it, uh, which it can. If, you, know, it, it, you have to realize is that when I, people say, well, uh, how, when is black too strong? Uh, black is too strong when it's too strong. It's, it, it compares to what it's around. So I can't tell you what works best all the time because there is not one mix, one color, one type of drop shadow that works well for everything. You've got to have a little bit, you know, your style comes into it, your technique comes into it, but the graphics you laid out, the colors you chose, the background color, the foreground color, the color of the graphic itself, the negative and positive space, the pinstriping you're using, all of this can determine the type of drop shadows and what colors you're going to want your drop shadows to be. And you don't, they don't have to be black at all. You can actually do colored drop shadows. There's different ways you can do it. Um, so when I, I, I'm showing you right here are just the basics and you can take and modify it uh, whichever way you want. Now, the one thing I learned from before is that opaque, I'd already reduced that down about 10%. It still is a little bit thick for me for this drop shadow. So I'm gonna add a little bit more reducer to it. And I like mixing it outside of my cup, of course, because I can get the mix better. Whenever you mix inside an airbrush, there's always a possibility of it not mixing right. But when I'm adding, if I want to just, I need to add a little bit more reducer. I'll just add to the brush, that's okay. Because I'm not worried about, in this situation, I was mixing black, 40, 50, and reducer, and I want to get it all mixed up. Now, do I need to wait 15 more minutes? No, no, that's the first initial thing. You can spike, or I call spiking, or, or, or adding reducer to your paint um, anytime you want. Just give it a good shake and then spray for at least three seconds. It takes about three seconds to clear out the area that is not gonna mix, which is the, what's in the nozzle and what's in the very bottom of the brush. By the way, if your airbrush um, is full to the top, let me get a towel here so I can wipe this off. If your airbrush is full all the way to the top, it will not shake, it will not agitate. Make sure that whenever you're mixing, you're adding reducer in, it's, it's no higher than three quarter full. Otherwise, there's no agitation. You're just like, okay, that's nice. It's still sitting on the top, it didn't go anywhere. And make sure that little hole is, uh, you already heard that little pop just now? That hole actually had something in it, it popped out. But if that hole is clogged, it can build up. Even if you have 30 PSI here, you can build up 100 PSI there. I've had that sucker blow up in my face before. Instant raccoon, so which I didn't mind, I just was glad it didn't hit my, my artwork. So, got a little bit more reducer in here, and I'm gonna come in and practice what I preached from before. I'm gonna come in and very lightly, come in on this side. This is, see it's a little bit more gray. Let's shift it over here so you can see a little bit better. I wasn't upset at how dark it was. I was upset at how dark it got fast. I want something to get dark with three passes, not the first pass. Because I can tell you something, I rarely do something right the first time. So I love building up layers. It's always easier to fix something when you're building up layers than if, oh well, I shot it, might as well erase it now. And I don't have plastic on this, so I can't take the plastic and see. Yeah. Also, if your airbrush has been sitting, and it's warm, like we got some lights in here, it'll start draw, giving you some tip dry, it'll start drying a little bit. Especially the opaques, that's what they're designed to do, they're doing their job, they're drying. And that drop shadow, that's pretty much all I'm gonna do on that. Um, I'm happy with it. I don't use opaque black for drop shadows anymore. And it's because of the fact that I can't get the clean gradation. I use opaque black for what it's designed for. Freaking covering stuff up, it's, it's opaque black. It's about as black as you can get. And the new wicked opaque black is the bomb. It's very, very cool. Matter of fact, the new wicked opaque colors, themse uh, opaque colors themselves 
all have excellent coverage and excellent clarity and the pigment, the, the grind they put on it, just, it, it's, it's great because in the past we've always had an issue where we have to balance. It's like if you want coverage, you can't have detail because it just ain't going to happen. Well, by really grinding that pigment fine, we're getting more pigment per square inch into that paint when it's being sprayed. You get better coverage, you get better transfer efficiency, you get better detail. You get better everything. So a lot of companies will say, oh no, you gotta use big pigments for coverage. I use the whole, that little thing about the jar of rocks. You know, put a bunch of rocks in a jar, you can see light through it, fill that rock, that jar full of sand, there's no more light. The bigger the pigment chunks, the more it's not gonna cover. You're gonna have to really, really stack it high to get to cover. The finer, the better. So for coverage, fine pigment's better. For, for detail, fine pigment's better. For gradation, fine pigment's better. So why do most companies out there not want to do that? I don't know, maybe they just don't want to spend the money. It takes freaking time and time's money. You got to put that sucker in there. And I mean, I don't even know how long Createx is grinding their pigments, but I know a lot of industry standards are only maybe 10, 12 hours. And I know Createx is grinding some of theirs for like 40 or 50 hours. So quite a bit longer than some of the other paints out there. So just food for thought, little, little, little something out there. Now we're going to come back in next and something's totally different. Now this is a pigment. We're going to come in now and we're going to actually use a dye, which is actually part of the Candy 2.0 system. We're going to come in and use the Candy 2.0 black and show you the difference on layering a black drop shadow compared to the opaque drop shadow. Okay, I've mixed up my Candy 2.0 black right here, which is uh, the 4664. And um, now can it spray right out of the bottle? It's so thin it does. It does spray very nicely out of the bottle. And for some canvas applications, I may actually use it right out of the bottle, but I still like using the binder because it makes it still adhese better. And uh, of course I used the 4050 in this and did the same kind of mixture. I did about a you know, three to one mixture of it. And then I added just a little bit of reducer. This is so thin, it doesn't need a whole lot more. Uh, again, you can hyper reduce and get more, but I'm not doing details here, I'm doing a drop shadow. So I probably went maybe two and a half percent reducer by comparison to 10% with the opaque black. And that literally is a, is a I could go in 20%. I think when I added, I'd probably end up going to maybe 15 to 20% in the long run when I did the final opaque. And this is only two and a half percent. And then stirred it up really good and let it sit for 15 minutes. Even the candies, yes, I'd, anytime you mix something, add reducer to it, let it sit for 15 minutes. Now, those of you that are mixing up colors ahead of time, Let's say you're gonna make a, a custom color and you're mixing the color together and you're adding the binder to it and you stir it all up and you mix it all up. Do you need to wait 15 minutes? I mean, no, you can put that in a bottle and put it off to the side. The ticking clock is when you add the reducer to it. The polyglycol alcohol in there starts actually ticking. So does this paint go bad in the long run? It, all paint does. Uh, anyone that says it doesn't, back in the day, oh, the lacquers, we could just pour it right back in the can, um, acts inappropriate. No, you can't. That lacquer uh, is going bad, and, uh, and by pouring it back in the can, you just contaminate the rest of the paint with a ticking time bomb of solvent that's breaking down. Because solvent is not made out of, it's not like one component, solvent. It's made out of numerous different distillates, and there's tail solvents that are designed to keep the paint open so that you can do layering, and those things leave first. And it's like the, the guy that shuts the lock on the nightclub after everyone goes home. These things evaporate first, so if you leave your reducer sitting out with the cap off, those are gone. It's not even the same thing anymore. Good quality reducer, let sitting overnight open, is gun washer the next day, pretty much. It's just, you know, you lose those components. Createx is no different. The reducer is not water. It's also not pure polyglycol alcohol. I don't even know what's all in it. But I'll tell you something, you do not want to add this to the paint and then come and stir it all up and put it in the bottle and come back like three weeks later. Now, how long will it last? This is dependent on the color. Some colors are more reactive than others. I'm not gonna give you a shopping list because that would also require me standardizing the reduction, which I don't do, and, uh, and how much the concentration of that color per binder, which I don't do because it varies on what I need it for. I would say, safe to say, I've never had a paint, a Craytex paint go bad in one day from my reducer. Uh, in the past, if you're using the 4020 or if you've used the 4012 in the past, it can go bad quicker because it is more of a caustic reducer. It's a hotter reducer. It starts attacking that resin. The resin starts to break down and then the pigments, when they're not encapsulating the resin, they actually start grouping together. That's where you get that seeding or that silting uh, in your candy. If that ever happens, like you've, you've mixed it up and it's three or four days later and you know some stuff in the bottom, don't strain it. Mix up some more paint. That's why when I mix up paint, I mix up very small quantities, what I need. 
and then I'm done. I may have colors I mix up, like I'm doing a series of guitars now, I needed all the same colors for all these guitars over a period of two months. So I mixed all the colors, but I didn't add any reducer to it. Let that, you know, put them in the bottles, and then I bring it out, mix up the reducers, sit 15 minutes, hey, no problem whatsoever. So I've been talking probably 15 minutes. So that's already in my gun, it's ready. So we've got Candy 2O Black in here, a little bit of the 4050, a little bit of the reducer. And we're gonna see right off the bat, bring this in here for you, for the cameraman. Right off the bat, it is a much smoother and much fainter drop shadow. A lot cleaner, and I probably could have reduced this even more and got it even more of a subtle gradation. That's pretty nice gradation. And it has a little bit of a violety tint to it. I love that. If you remember my old articles, I was always adding violet to my black. What I was doing back in the day, I was doing the, I was using the quinocridone violet from PPG, it was DMD 624. Well, I haven't used that stuff in 20 years, but you know, it sticks in your head. Uh, DMD 624, I'd add to my black. And that was a pure toner, high strength toner. And it would make it a very purpley black. Well, there's very little black that would be left in it. And I then would add, um, I can't remember what it was, I think it was DBC 500 or, um, but I would add, which is a balancing clear, I'd add that in to thin it down a little bit more, you know, to extend it out and then add reducer three, RU 311. So these are the tricks. Now, when I started using other paints, or, you know, I started, you know, that was, um, no, RU 311, sorry, that was my bad, that's House of Color. I went in House of Color, did the same thing, took their, their BC 25 black, I mixed it up with their version of uh, a Violent Candy, which is KK13, I believe, which is a little bit on the magenta side, so I had to add some Oriental Blue into it. And then I reduced down with RU311. I think the 1180 was what I was using with PPG. I took the same exact thing with Kratex. I mean, I, I'm not expecting, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. If you have previous knowledge from any paint system on known to mankind, that knowledge is still applicable to when you go to a new paint system. So all I did was just really come over, and the first thing I did, I never assume everything transfers directly. I found out how many of my techniques, how many of my mixing, how many of my theory applied. I'd say, honestly, between, between solvent and water base, about 85% of my techniques are the same. Not a lot changed. And then the ones that, that did change, I was able to modify and adapt. I, there, I can guarantee there's not a single technique, trick, or effect I did with solvent I can't do with water base in a different way. There's not one out there. Matter of fact, I'll challenge anyone to, that could be like a fun video. You know, mess with Craig's. Like, tell me an effect you want me to do in water base that you think can only be done in solvent. Huh? And by definition, we got polyglacal alcohol in the water, so we got some solvent in here. But you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about solvent, talking about water base. I'm an artist, man. I'm not a product spokesperson or a salesman. I, I do both, but I'm better at being an artist. So right there, you see that that's, that's I, I'm gonna leave it like that. That's really nice and subtle. I could have gone even lighter if I wanted to. Um, but then you get too light, it doesn't look like a shadow much. You kind of lose it. And I always make sure it's a little bit darker. A key to doing drop shadows, so where are you aiming? If you think of doing a drop shadow under it, you will naturally create that halo stripe, the one where you're underneath, because you're thinking, I gotta be under. I'm, I'm, I started under here, but I aimed at the line. If you aim right at the line, half your paint's gonna end up in your tape, which is fine, it gets unmasked anyway, and then half your paint is going to end up, uh, you know, where it's supposed to be, on the paper itself. Now, we're gonna unmask this. Now, this is something to consider. If I unmask this, you're gonna see a drop shadow and drop shadow and you see nothing up here. Maybe a little bit of overspray, not much. This is where candy comes in. I very lightly am going over the whole thing. And I know what you're thinking, hey, you just said not to do that. That's the worst thing in the world. Worst thing in the world and you're just honking the paint on like a madman. I'm gonna do it up here too. So that I've got a, I can see the flame. I want a little, and you can say, I can't even see what you're doing. Good, if you can see what you're doing, you screwed up. Just a little bit of a halo, because I might use this just while I unmask it, I'll come in so I can see what I need to pinstripe. And then when you pinstripe it, it should be so slow you don't even see it. Just a slight little halo there. I'll, to get it out of the way, I'll do one right now, since I got black in the brush, all the way around this whole thing, just very lightly. And this is because I've got, you know, I, it's gonna be a white flame over a white background. Very subtle, very, very subtle. Matter of fact, Let's take it one step further. Let's go around so we'll have a, a neat little framing system. I'll darken it on the top like this frame that we masked off. This is where the drop shadow would be. This side, this side, a little bit all the way around so that you can see the 
see, fun with drop shadows. Guess what this works on too? In matter of fact, if you want to say, okay, this is probably the easiest way of figuring out a drop shadow is a box. And then you got the flame is the next level. What'd be the level after that? Freaking lettering. Lettering's got all kinds of weird little shit and it's got the angles. It's like, what the heck is that angle gonna do? Well, you gotta think about it. Think about the, when, you, when you're doing a drop shadow, imagine the whole thing you're drop shadowing just shifted down at that angle. People say, well, what, what angle should, uh, 30%, I don't, I don't know, 30 degrees, 60 degrees, what, just make sure whatever angle, whatever you're doing is the same on the entire vehicle. Now the one thing you can get a mistake on, let's say I'm doing these flames on, and this would be the driver's side of the car because of the direction of the flames, and I'm doing all these flames on all these flames, all these flames, I'm thinking to the right, to the right, to the right, and I do all the flames on one side of the car, and then my brain has gone lizard on me, and it's like to the right, to the right, to the right, and I go on the other side of the car, and what's the first thing my brain goes? To the right. Well, guess what the right is? The opposite of what's supposed to be. Because on the left side of the car, it's to the left, to the left, to the left. So this is a good reason why you should not just get into a groove. People say, oh, I gotta get into the groove. Grooves are bad unless they're taking you where you wanna go. You know, a train needs a groove to go in, but no one likes driving bias ply tires on the freeway because it just follows wherever that freeway takes you to. So make sure you're thinking when you're painting because it's super easy to all of a sudden get in a groove and then it doesn't apply anymore and then you just look like you made a third grade 101 mistake. So that's all nice and drop shadowed and, uh, and I'm ready to go on to the last flame. Now, I didn't do this drop shadow yet because I'm gonna show, uh, we're gonna spike my candy black. Actually, I'm gonna probably dump out the black. So how little in black am I gonna leave in here? I'm gonna dump it out and leave a dirty airbrush and then add, <laughs> add some candy into it. I want to be a darker than, than candy. I'm gonna use candy red. Darker than just pure red, but black is so strong, even the candy black, it's gonna really darken that red. So I'm gonna come and just empty out the airbrush, put candy red, mix it up, put it in the airbrush, and then I'm gonna do a candy red drop shadow on this one to show how you can use a colored drop shadow, but you still want to be a little bit darker than just a pure color by itself. Okay, now I've got my candy red uh, right here, candy 2-0, uh, blood red, and I did the exact same thing, a three to one mix with the, the 40-50, and then a little bit, maybe two, two and a half percent, maybe five percent uh, reducer, stirred it up nice, let it sit 15 minutes, put it in the airbrush. Now, um, remember I told you I wasn't gonna clean my airbrush, I was gonna dump out the black. Um, I didn't just dump it out, I dumped it out and I sprayed until nothing else came out. So all the only black that was left was what's on the inside of the cup and the lid. And that's all I needed to get what I would consider a little bit of a darker version of red. It's not much, I don't need much. You can always add black, you can't take it away. And I'm gonna come in very lightly. And I do like doing my layers, taking my time with this color, especially since it's a candy. Candies are designed to be layered. Now, could I add more black to this? Sure, I could. I'm not going to. I'm happy with that. And I'm going to go around the whole... I'm going to do a nice red fade over the whole thing lightly which will then make sense as to why the drop shadow is red. We'll say the whole thing's got a little bit of a red cast to it. So if you're working with a monochromatic paint job and it's all one color, you got a lot of blues, and we've done low riders where a lot of the colors were you know, blues or purples or whatever, all just one, one chroma, one area of colors. To come in with a really harsh black, uh, especially if you're just doing your, what are called tape shade designs underneath the candy, that can sometimes be too much. And plus, if you're using a solid black on top of a metal flake, and you're putting candy on top of it, you lose some of that metal flake. But guess what you can do? You use that candy black, and you can come in and not hide the metal flake. You can get, bring that, that black value in, but still allow the flake to come through with the candy. Not to mention, you could tint your candies. I've done tape shades underneath candies where I took, let's see, I'm doing a candy red on top of something. I'll do a candy violet, or a candy purple or a candy black underneath that very faintly, then I put the red on top and it, it's not like, oh, you can't, you know, a candy green even. People say, why would you do green under red? 
uh, color, remember, I think it's color theory, it's a complementary. Green and red get dark together, same way purple and yellow, the same way that blue and orange do. So uh, best way to remember your complementaries, uh, Broncos, Lakers, Christmas. You know, so green and red, blend those together, you're going to get a brownish, darkish color. So you do a green underlie on something and then you hit it with red, it gives it that dark look but not the color killing black. Neat little trick right there. So we got all of our red here, we got our candy black here, and we got our opaque black up there. And then uh, what I do is I'm going to go ahead and unmask them and then uh, you'll be able to see them all in, in their entirety. Okay, got all the panel unmasked, so you can see the, the differences between all three of them. And uh, remember when you were looking, you probably thought, oh yeah, you can barely see that black, and all of a sudden it pops out really a lot. Now, that's gonna take some practice when you're just doing that light candy black over areas. The first time you do it, you think you don't have enough, you add more, and then you unmask, and you're like, oh crap, that's more than I needed. That just takes practice. But as you can see, you can see literally the color differences. This opaque black over here, it does have a deeper, darker black. This one's more of a, of a, a violet. Now, what if I didn't want the violet? What if I wanted more of a sepia? black. You can get that very easily. Add a little bit of tequila candy, the tequila you know, yellow candy to um, the candy black and you'll push it over into that direction a little bit. And uh, it looked very nice. But you'll see the, the difference between the, the red and the black. Now if I had added more black into the red I could have gotten a shadow like that. But I wanted you to see the difference. This isn't pure red. This is red with just a few drops of the candy black in it, which trust me, a drop can go a long ways. If you don't, try dropping a, one drop of red and a gallon of white and you'll get pink, trust me. So uh, you've got a number of different um, ways of applying the, the drop shadows, but I still will insist that there are some things you just have to do correctly. You know, keep the tips away at the end, you know, observe the shift, be, have continuity throughout your entire piece, make sure it's all in one direction, and you don't want it to be grady and, you know, grainy and chunky and, 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 and coarse because a drop shadow is by definition just a soft area where the light isn't at. Now, one thing we didn't show here that you could do if you wanted to, I've seen people that have masked off separate drop shadows. Uh, you can see it in lettering. Well, they'll actually brush in a gray drop shadow. You use like a medium gray or something. You could do that. I call those Nagel drop shadows because Patrick Nagel did a lot of mass shadows and all this portrait work back in the 70s and 80s. But uh, that's a lot of work. Now, it does have a kind of a cool look to it. That's up to you. Maybe that's, that'll be your style. I just show this as basically one of the cheap tricks and special effects that every custom painter is going to apply at one time or another. Whether you're doing flames, graphics, lettering, or just a mural, you're going to have to understand the concept of shadows. And I learned mine not from airbrushing, I learned them from a, it was actually a shadow casting class I took a Cal Poly in architecture. I recommend not doing a six year course at Cal Poly in architecture just to learn that. But it did help me understand the concept of light source, azimuth, and the different ways that the light can cast different shadows at different angles. And it does help. The best way to help, the best tool I can give you on this is just practice. Just keep on doing them until they look clean, until they look nice. If you like them, the client likes them, everyone else likes them. It's a win. So hope you enjoyed this first installment of the Craig Fraser's Cheap Tricks and Special Effects. And this one was on Drop Shadows. And I will see you next time when we do another video here at the studios of Craytex Colors.